Today I want to talk about, oh, you did Today I want to talk about facts and giving facts. And I want to show you something real special. Okay. You see that? My sister made this for me. And it says, just for you. And you guys know my nephew John. Sometimes they come. Well, I gave Lisa her baby shower before John was born. And she wrote, Lori, I can't believe you did this for me. I love you for who you are and what you stand for. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Love, Lisa. And on the back, she put what his name was going to be. She said, don't tell anyone, because it was a big secret. Big secret. So, that means, this means a lot to me, and I keep it in my Bible, because it's very special. And I want to tell you a little story about what Jesus did. Do you remember there were ten men who were sick? They had leprosy. And they, and they went, and Jesus healed them. And do you remember how many came back and told him thank you? One. That's right. Only one person came back and said thank you to Jesus. And he said, wonder where the other nine are. But only one came back. So that just reminds us that we always need to be thankful for what God has done for us and what he has given us. So this, what is this holiday coming up? It's very special. Thanksgiving. That's right. And can you tell me one thing that you're thankful for? For a home? Do you know what you're thankful for? That's okay. How about you? Okay. You're thankful for, for parents and grandparents? Yeah. How about you? Yeah. For food? So what? What are you thankful for? For water, absolutely. And that was in our Sunday school lesson today. We talked about water and the living water that Jesus brings. Um, just remember that we want to be thankful to God every day and not just at the holiday, okay? So let's say a little prayer here. Dear Lord, you give us everything you need. Sometimes we forget to say thank you. We thank you now and ask that you help us. Remember to give you thanks every day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I have some coloring pages here that you girls can work on. Do you know what cornucopia is? I do that. Did you see the cornucopia up there? That usually means it's, it's, it's called a corn of plenty. Okay, so you guys can work on color that, okay? Thank you very much. Where they will be fruitful and increase in number. 
I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous. The word of God for the people of God.
reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the 23rd chapter, beginning with the 33rd verse. Luke chapter 23, verse 33. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we boldly, boldly proclaim the reign of Christ. Christ is the King. But today we also take the opportunity to ask ourselves just what does this mean? What kind of king do we want? Do we even want a king? The country and the world today are weary and wary of those who seek power. So what does it mean for us when we say that Christ is the king? Do we look to Jesus for the trappings of human kings? Do we look to Jesus for our security and our defense against the other people? Do we look to Jesus to affirm our values, to our, affirm our lifestyles or our ideas of right and wrong? Do we look to Jesus for our prosperity. I think that when we look back on the recent election, we find that these are the things that we as a country voted for. But when we come to understand the reign of Christ, our wonderment must be if Christ could ever win one of our elections. Jesus was decidedly not the party favorite. If he was the Messiah, they certainly would have voted for him rather than crucifying him. That question was posed to him over and over. If you are the Messiah, save yourself. In this question, we hearken back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit had led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread, or throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. But Jesus would not use divine power for his own gratification. He didn't do it then, and he doesn't do it now, or he didn't do it when he was crucified, even to save himself from the cross. To use that power would have put Jesus squarely in the devil's camp. And the reign of Christ would have been all about wielding earthly power. Instead, it is about vulnerability and peace. Jesus went to his death forgiving those who had crucified him. He had the power to come down from the cross, but he chose not to. He chose to be vulnerable and not prove his kingship in human terms. In refusing the voices of temptation, Jesus showed us the kind of king he truly is. He is not a king who wields earthly power according to the rules and the logic of this world. What kind of king is Jesus? Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, sang to his infant son, You, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Jesus the King will change the earthly order of things. Before he was born, Mary, his mother, sang praises to God. The Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Jesus is the king, but over which realm is he king? The kingdom of God is a place where there is peace and justice. It is a place where the first shall be last and the last first. It is a place where the greatest of all is the servant of all. It is the place where even the rich and powerful care about the things God cares about. The downtrodden, the dispossessed, the poor, the lost the least, and the last. But Jesus also described the kingdom of God as a mustard seed. A mustard seed is very, very small, but when it is planted, it grows into a large bush, big enough for the birds of the air to come and make nests in its branches. The kingdom of God is also like yeast, which when it's mixed in with the dough, soon leavens the entire loaf. So the kingdom of God is ubiquitous. It's pervasive. It's a place for living, for living right now. You know, we get the impression that the, that the kingdom of God is only this far off, misty, distant shore that we will come to in the end times. However, the kingdom of God is also hope, grace, and mercy for right here and right now. It's a state of being 
in which we can live and enjoy now. It's available to us everywhere we are and whoever we are. And it grows like yeast in a loaf of bread. And one little yeasty bug grows into another and another and another and it just keeps on going as we make disciples for Christ. Disciples, beginning disciples, beginning disciples, while the kingdom spreads ever wider and farther until the whole earth, the whole earth and maybe beyond, is brought within the reign of Christ. Even so, we cannot experience the fullness of God's kingdom in this life. And that, that's what makes it hard for us. And we can see the way this world works or seems to work, but we can only get a glimpse of the kingdom of God. And much of what we see of the way that works, we have to take on faith. You know, we learn about it in Sunday school. Jesus loves me, this I know. Well, the Bible tells me so. We learn about it in our hymns, in our liturgy. And we learn about it every time we hear Jesus' words to love God with your whole being and love your neighbor as yourself. There are two characters in Luke's story of the crucifixion of Jesus who get us to the center of what the reign of Christ means. The criminal crucified next to Jesus rebuked the mocking of his companion saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we have been, we indeed have been been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong and then after Jesus died the centurion the Roman centurion who was guilty of carrying out the crucifixion says certainly this man was innocent these two people stand for all of humanity. And we live into the reign of Christ when we recognize in them our standing before God. We are guilty. And our situation is hopeless. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Our kingdoms are where our will and our desires determine what happens and what does not happen. Our kingdoms are where what we say and what we think and what we believe determines the shape of our lives and the lives of those around us. The kingdom of God is where God's desires, God's dreams for all of creation, God's will and God's intentions rule. The kingdom is where God's designs determine the shape of human life. The reign of Christ is real, and it is real right now. The reign of Christ is present wherever people pray without ceasing the way Jesus taught us to pray. The reign of Christ is present wherever people have the fruits of the Spirit. The reign of Christ is present whenever, wherever, Someone says no to the easy way 
of taking advantage of another. The reign of Christ is present whenever someone says no to hurtful and destructive words and behaviors. The reign of Christ is present wherever someone gives of time and treasure and talent to preserve life to lift up and encourage and to offer peace. The reign of Christ is present whenever someone helps someone in need. The reign of Christ is present Wherever these things are done, just because, just because it is the will of Jesus Christ the King, and we are of his kingdom, right here and right now. Jesus Christ, the incarnate word of God, came to establish his kingdom, not after the fashion of earthly kings, but as an eternal kingdom characterized by new life and hope and grace and love. A love that does not grow weary. A love that does not perish. We can have this kingdom today. Christ the King offers healing for our hurts, for our pain, for our guilt. He offers forgiveness. He sends us out from worship today free. We are free to live into this new reality of His kingdom. We are free to fix the broken things of our lives. We are free to mend relationships. We are free to act more like his brothers and sisters. We are free to gladly give of what we have and of who we are. And despite our